it going, everybody? Today, we're going to talk about the big elephant in the room. That's going to be Russia and the issue with the geopolitical landscape in our investing decisions. Now, we just came out of COVID and we're still in COVID. And now we're seeing we're probably seeing this World War Three kind of unfold here. And the bigger question is, how should you be positioning yourself in this crazy, crazy uh, news cycle driven narrative? And so we'll go ahead and talk about some projects I'm looking. I'm also going to give you guys some of the things I'm doing as far as my portfolio and also kind of give you guys the outlook as far as the macro perspective of how this is going to unfold. Now, before we start, though, you got to keep in mind that the market is extremely volatile right now. This is not the time to be kind of trading, actively trading and buying stuff, even in the stock market or in the crypto market, because a lot of stuff is changing almost every single day. So let's go ahead and talk about the Pentagon. Uh, they were actually meeting with Russia today uh, about talking about this repositioning from uh, the attack on Ukraine. And so the thing is that um, we've already known this for a while, right? The question is what's actually happening? Um, Ukraine has been a flashpoint in the Russian and the U.S. Uh, relationships since uh, 2014 when Russia invaded Crimea. And uh, this is actually where an next Crimea, not necessarily, an, uh, uh, you know, invaded it. Um, and so what had happened was early during that time period, um, they have been really aggressive with moving over to um, the Ukrainian side. Now, again, I'm not going to hear it play sides, whether it's Russia or the U.S. All I'm here to say is that, you know, this has been an ongoing issue since um, 2014. Now, let's go back and rewind the clock a little bit. Um, Russia and Ukraine have been, you know, there's been this issue with after the Soviet Union had um, dissolved, there was a loss of about 14 Russian territories uh, during 1991, during the fall of the Soviet Union. And a lot of that was recaptured by NATO, which is represented by the Western countries. And so now it's kind of like Russia saying, hey, you know what, we need to kind of step back in here and reclaim some of that territory. That's basically what it is in a nutshell. So what's happening is Russia is, is putting in about 100,000 troops uh, on the border of Ukraine's eastern border, which there's actually sections in there right now that are pro-Russian um, uh, pro-Russian and and also trying to support a lot of the separatist movements um, away from uh, the Western countries. And so Ukraine is becoming a, this really big, uh, I would say, flashpoint in the Russian and U.S. Uh, relationships and also with uh, European NATO uh, allied members. Now, the Pentagon has now ordered that all U.S. troops are going to leave Ukraine and reposition somewhere in Europe to avoid a potential conflict. Now, the marching order comes after 100,000 Russian troops are equipped with advanced weaponry uh, in Ukraine's eastern border and northern border. And the State Department has also reduced all diplomatic staff at the U.S. Embassy uh, in Kiev to, to the bare minimum. So basically what's happening right now is unfortunately because of this situation with the Ukrainian um, the Ukrainian uh, conflict, we're seeing all the traditional markets completely sell off on Friday. In fact, I've never seen such heavy volume on the put option side as investors are beginning to reposition themselves on a possible all out war. Now, with all that said. There is going to be a lot of the new stuff, a lot of the narrative that kind of drives the price action. But we've already started to see some of the issues with this market that goes beyond the Ukrainian and, and Russian conflict. It has more to do with the inflation number that came out as well last week and this week. And it, what it had to do was that inflation had reached the highest it's ever been, 7.5% to be exact. And so if you take a look at the crypto prices, you know, we, we actually didn't really sell off that much. I mean, yeah, we did have this um, kind of big little minor sell off here, but it wasn't anything that would warrant a full on sell the news event. And the reason is because if you take a look at the last seven days, I mean, yeah, sure, that one day kind of hurt. The last seven days, we've been pretty much flat for the session. So although the news does look real bad, 
the reality is that we're not really in that situation where it's kind of like sell everything, dump everything, throw the baby with the with the bathtub, bath water, so to speak. And uh, most of the time, you can see that majority of the tokens have actually are okay in the green. I mean, there's a couple of tokens that actually did very well this last week. In fact, Shiba did about 30%. Um, we're seeing Gala did about 20. Now, granted, they, they were up a lot more than what they are right now. But the point I'm trying to make is that even though it may look real bad, um, if you take a look on the seven day period, um, they did actually, they didn't really do too bad. I mean, they just kind of gave up some of that profit. We have Kadena, which was 26%, uh, XRP 27, uh, Shiba mentioned earlier 30, Theta did 21, Gala did 20. So although not as bad as you know people may think it is, it is kind of a little problematic because we're not getting a lot of steam and momentum in the market. All right, so let's take a look at some of the um, active price action and, and take a look at what's actually, well, before we do that, let's take a look at some of the headline news that's coming out of this market so that we can kind of get a better idea for what's to come for next week. So basically on our last uh, video, I mentioned about K KPMG adding Bitcoin to its balance sheet, right? This is a very, very positive development, and that's kind of getting overshadowed by many of the geopolitical stuff happening and also with the inflation. So, you know, if fact remains, guys, is that companies are still adding in crypto to their balance sheets. Companies are still developing projects, are still working on expanding their crypto uh, mainstream adoption. So reality is we still have a lot, a lot of positive developments despite a lot of the problems uh, in here. Now we do have also regulations that starting to really crack down on some of the um, some of the DeFi stuff. So BlockFi was ordered to pay a hundred million dollars penalty to, to to stop opening high yield Bitcoin accounts. And this kind of goes back on this idea that you know people are putting in their Bitcoin and then they're lending it out uh, so they can get yield. And this unfortunately is not sustainable because uh, basically what they're actually doing is playing a role in the whole banking system which requires sec regulation so uh you know i think there's going to be a slowdown in some of this uh some of these DeFi projects and also some of these yield bearing instruments which unfortunately is going to lend itself to some sort of scrutiny and also regulation as well now in addition to that we talked about the bitfinex hike i'm sure by now you've already heard about the bitfinex hack um and the bitcoin laundering scheme that uh, they're doing they're actually doing a netflix documentary which is going to be really interesting to watch but basically what happened was this is going to be one of the largest government seizures ever uh which is a report of 4.5 billion dollars in uh, money laundered through bitfinex and this for those of you guys who don't remember this was back in 2016 so it took the government you know about six years to kind of capture some of this now what's interesting about this is that uh, the people who obviously were arrested uh, they were laundering about 120,000 bitcoins, uh, and they had also had uh, moved them through ATM machines and through NFTs, etc. And so, what's interesting about this uh, specific one is that we're starting to see that there are a lot, a lot of you know unresolved issues with some of these projects because many of these projects tend to kind of do a lot of this situation where they're starting to. You know do yields and they're starting to sell that and i think that's where a lot of the problems kind of run into so that's kind of something interesting to see there's also let me take a look at um let me take a look at the other part and i think this is where everybody starts to kind of look at some of the reasons why we're selling off but if you take a look at some of the um major major headlines happening here is that one of the ones that came to my attention was blackrock right BlackRock was going to be offering crypto trading and BlackRock is the one of the largest uh, asset managers in the world. Uh, they're planning on offering, they have over $10 trillion in assets for institutions and they plan on entering the crypto space by allowing them to have their own credit facility and so on. Now this is usually going to be something more for the institutional investors because uh, BlackRock doesn't really you know, cater too much to the small retail. Uh, in many different ways. But this is actually a very good sign that we still have institutional adoption happening behind the scenes, even though we do have a lot of geopolitical events. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at some of the some of the markets overall. We're going to get started with um, our Bitcoin. Actually, we're starting to see a little bit of a rebound today. So it's not necessarily a bad thing that we got this little dip. I think it gives everybody a good entry to get in. Um, but let's take a look at what's happening right here. So 
we started at 46,000. We've come back down a little bit. You know, Bitcoin took a small hit. Like I said, I mean, it's not that bad. It's only about a 7% hit. This Crimea, this Ukraine, um, Russian geopolitical event, I think it's more of a I, you know, kind of eyeball catch type of thing because Russia has always been kind of pushing towards Ukraine anyway. But to me, it's not worth trying to trade on the news just because uh, Russia is going to potentially invade and we're going to get into this World War III scenario because the price action doesn't really doesn't really explain that, right? Um, every single time we look at these narratives and these stories, it's very easy to say, well, I think the market's going down because of X, Y, and Z. But we've been going down since November. So a lot of this is already priced into the market. And even if we do get a pullback here, there is a lot of support at Bitcoin in that 30 range. So I wouldn't be really panicking at this point. I think anybody who sells here would be pretty much panic selling just because of the fact that they heard that potentially we may go into World War III. I don't personally think we're going to do that. I think it's just going to get resolved at some point. Uh, is Russia going to go to Ukraine? I don't know. Don't really. It's not really within my realm of expertise to discuss. All I know is that uh, Bitcoin's hash rates are going up. Bitcoin's halving rates, uh, well, obviously the amount of Bitcoin that's being out right now is low and, and, and big institutions are coming in to purchase it. So that's all I need to know, supply demand dynamics. Now, for the people who are a little bit scared and say, well, what if this happens, this happens, then obviously we're looking at a price action where we're going to possibly retest those lows. So, I mean, I think it's really easy to kind of assume that this downtrend hasn't been technically broken, right? We're, we're still kind of downtrending. Technically speaking, we've done a lot better in the last several days than ever before. I mean, in fact, we kind of crossed over on a lot of these short term metrics. So the price action technically is, in my opinion, is more of a buy the dip situation versus sell the rally situation. But that's my financial, that's my, you know, personal opinion. I wouldn't, um, I, I would make sure you do your own research for that one, because obviously there's a chance that we can go down. Now for ETH, um, it's, it's a little bit of a different story because ETH is trying to recapture this um, the support area that we saw uh, back a while ago, which was at that 2.8 area. And so I think there's going to be a little bit of backfilling in that one. And so with the altcoins in general, I think you kind of want to be real careful with them. You don't want to be over committing to some of these positions because if this Russia, um, you know, US thing gets kind of drawn out a little bit, the, the negative news cycle is probably going to continue to dominate people's um, people's portfolios. And there's a very high chance that people are not going to continue to allocate money in it. And that's what's going to slow down a lot of the rallies. That's really what I'm kind of worried about at this moment. Okay, so what are some coins I'm looking at right now? I really believe that the uh, gaming metaverse NFT space is still very, very early. I mean, I, I believe that um, there's still a lot of money kind of flowing into the market. I also think that, you know, there's a lot of opportunity in some of these stable coins, specifically Convex and Curve. Now, again, this is not financial advice, so my own personal opinion. But I believe that there's going to be a lot of repricing on these tokens because they provide a very good service for many of these upcoming protocols that have to depend on liquidity, specifically with Curve Finance, which I mentioned a while ago. And uh, the reasons why is because during these market downturns, people are going to be holding some sort of stables to gather some some liquidity. Now, the price action, unfortunately, has followed um, the current bear market that we're in right now. But I suspect that this is going to eventually cool off just because there's a lot of value inherent built into the tokens because of the fact that they're emission tokens. Um, and the other thing also has to do with the governance token in addition in curve in curve situation where where uh, users are able to use curve to put into uh, their existing uh, yield pools and be able to dictate the protocol level. So I think this is a very interesting kind of idea. I know it's a little bit more complicated, a little bit more of a DeFi kind of play. But uh, if you take a look at stuff like Matic, I think Matic has a lot of potential in in the overall time frames, longer term time frames, obviously. Short term volatility could continue to go lower, but Matic has one of the better, um, I would say, uh, layer layer two scaling solutions for ETH that we desperately need right now. So if I were to pick any altcoin right now, I'd probably be picking Matic at the moment. I think it has a lot of potential, and I also think that it's definitely beaten down enough that you know you could scoop some up here. All right, we've enjoyed this uh, video. Make sure uh, you like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time.